Kirby's Dream Land. In the game concepts category of videos, I'd like to talk about the concepts behind the games I've directed myself. It'd be a waste not to. I won't be going into detail about every step of the process, but instead focusing on the core concepts of each title. I could talk for days about these games, but I'll try to keep it short and sweet. I say short, but these videos may run a bit longer than the others. So get comfortable. Today we'll be talking about the very first Kirby game. This was the first game I directed. My debut, you could say. I was 19 when I wrote the initial proposal. I was helping on other projects at the time. So we didn't start development until later. I didn't think as hard about risk and reward as I do now. I just thought it would be fun if the players could use enemies. Why is that so fun, you might ask? I'll explain more in another video. But in short, it's about risk and reward and the dual purpose that enemies serve. In Mega Man, you can use the weapons of defeated bosses. But that's not using the enemies. It's more a reward for beating them, which is a little different. When designing Kirby's Dream Land, I thought there had to be an easier way to take advantage of the enemies on screen. At first, I wanted Kirby to use his tongue to grab foes, but in the end, I decided to have him inhale them and spit them out. The tongue idea might make you think of Yoshi, but this was back before Yoshi existed. Kirby has one more key trait. I gave him the ability to fly, because I thought it was too harsh to lose a life just for missing a jump. Think about being hit by an enemy versus falling into a pit. I'd say neither one is too serious a mistake. But even in action games with health bars, falling usually meant instant death. So, I kept the penalty of losing a life if you fall, but gave players the ability to fly over these gaps. You could use this to skip enemies too. But the Game Boy screen was so small, I don't mind making things a little easier. Inhaling enemies and flying. Both reduced the potential risks players face during gameplay. This might seem like it would have sucked all the fun out of the game. But I wanted to make the first Kirby as accessible as possible for new players. During development, people asked, Are you sure about this? To which I replied, Sure, I'm sure, and proceeded full steam ahead. When I first joined the game industry and started working in development, the NES was on its way out. The NES was infamous for having a lot of difficult games. One factor behind that was the limited memory on an NES cartridge. You could only fit so much unique content, so if a player wasn't tough as nails, players would beat it too quickly, which was a real letdown when games cost 50 or 60 bucks a pop. Unlike RPGs, where you fight the same battles over and over, action games struggled to offer long-term value. But even if you made a game unreasonably hard, you'd leave beginners out in the cold. Which brings us back to Kirby, who I created to welcome newcomers to the world of games. Now, some games end when you beat them, but others, like arcade games, aren't so easy to put down, are they? If it's fun, you play it again and again. Though the first Kirby was relatively easy, those who played it kept going back for more. I'd say it was one of the better feeling action games on the Game Boy. And did you know there's a sound test in there as well? From the way each stage begins right after the musical intro concludes, to Kirby's signature victory dance, you can see that we put a lot of love into music as well. In the end, Kirby's Dream Land is still the best-selling game in the entire series. That just goes to show that positioning the game for beginners was a good decision for the time. And there you have it. 
In our next Game Concepts video, we'll be talking about Kirby's Adventure. And we'll continue from there in release order. Stage clear.